Welcome to the NYU Steinhardt Jazz Interview Series. And today I'm honored and excited to speak with Herb Elpert and Lonnie Hall. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Nice it's to a be pleasure here. to be here. So I, I just want to get through some preliminaries here and just say that uh, uh, Herb, you're co-founder of A&M Records in right. 1962. 62. 62. And you've sold over 72 million records. Yourself, you went to store each store. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nine Grammys, and, and in 2003, you, you received uh, the National Medal of Arts from President Obama. Congratulations. Right. Fantastic. And uh, Lonnie, I want to, you're as amazing, and uh, Grammy Award winning singer, Brazil 66, and uh, I can't believe you're singing on a James Bond theme. <laughs> That's fantastic. That was fun. That's that was a fun gig. That was the first time that Sergio and Herb and I were in the studio since I had left the group. So it was, it was an exciting time. That was Never Say Never. Never Say Never Again. Wow. Yeah. And uh, do you ever have to sing that on stage when you're performing now? No. <laughs> I don't. I don't sing that song. I do a medley of okay. Brazil 66 songs, but I don't sing Never Say Never. Okay, good. Well, we got that out of the way. <laughs> so um, I, I want to hit you guys with this concept because you've, you've done so much. And I heard Bill Clinton say this once, and he says, uh, talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. Absolutely, man. I mean, I think every, a lot of people are talented, and they don't explore it. Um, it's like learning uh, the ABCs. I mean, if you start painting and you think you give up real quickly, that's just the wrong, wrong avenue. You should try to uh, you know put a little discipline on it. Mm -hmm. But but I think more than that is like there's people very talented around the world and there's no outlet for them. Absolutely and, true. And the, and the reason I say that is where you grew up in Southern California, in the 50s, was at the heart of a lot of things. The for, for the jazz movement, it was like the cool jazz movement. It was really cool, because I, in high school, I used to go see Jerry Mulligan, the, the Mulligan Quartet at The Hague, and it was Mulligan and uh, Chet Baker and Carson Smith and- Chico uh, Hamilton. Chico was playing drums, and, and Jerry, after they'd play a set, Jerry would get up to the microphone and stare out at the crowd and say, shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's cool. Yeah, now that's really cool. <laughs> and he looked like he was probably 100 pounds at that time, right? Well, he wasn't, and uh, Jerry was a dear friend of ours. You know, he recorded for A&M. We became very close with him and Franca, and uh, mm -hmm. he used to come over to the house lots. And he told me a story about when he was playing with the 10 sax players from uh, when uh, President Clinton was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all played together, or separately, or however they did it. And I spoke to Jerry uh, about three days after. I said, how was it? It must have been an, an interesting affair. He says, well, I'll tell you the truth, man. These young guys, they know all the chords, all the modes. They can play high and low, fast and slow. They, they got the whole thing covered. He says, the only thing they can't do is Leave the bone alone. <laughs> I love that description. I mean, you know, it ain't what you do, it's the way how you do it in that space is an important ingredient. Well, uh, last night around midnight, I was listening to your interview with Alec Baldwin. Oh. And you were talking about your, your time with Stan Getz. Yeah. And you, can you just talk about, recap that? Because this was interesting when you asked him if he would uh, evaluate Did, your playing? Well, I didn't ask him if he would evaluate. I said, can you give me some bebop lessons? I, you know, I didn't play with Charlie Parker. I'm just trying to get up to my own water level. And Stan and I were really close. He said, well, how, how honest do you want me to be? I said, just be as honest. I mean, just give me the truth, you know? So I started playing something on, with the music minus one record. And, you know, I played a little thing, and he, and he looked at me. He says, you know, you can't just play jazz, man. He says, you got to play jazz. I mean, that was his description <laughs> of how to play jazz. And so, um, 
But in that interview, you said uh, maybe we should start with 251. Oh, well, that, of course, yeah. That, no, that was the real eye opener because I, it started with you think I should work on the 251 chords in, in every key as a starting point. And he looked at me at this, in, with this puzzled look in the eye. I, he said, What do you mean? I says, What do you mean? What do you mean? The, you know, the, the two chord, the five chord, and the one chord in all keys. Right. I, I don't know what you're talking about. So, I mean, the point is, he, he didn't relate to that type of thinking. You know, we've taken all these great jazz musicians in the past and kind of analyzed what they did and how they did it and how they played on certain chords, et cetera. And those guys didn't think that way. I mean, well, it was interesting. Um, this morning I was in my office up the street, and uh, one of my teachers is John Schofield, the great guitarist. And, and I told him that story. I said, I just heard Herb say this last night about uh, Stan Getz. And he says, well, that I, he said, I worked with Chet Baker and Miles, and they were the same thing. He said, and I will tell you that Chet knew all the notes in the chord, but he didn't, he, he didn't formally call it that. Absolutely. I knew Chet and uh, it was instinct, man. He was, he knew the chords by ear, by instinct. I mean, the guy could go through a, a, a minefield of, of changes like he knew exactly what was happening at the, in, at the exact moment. He didn't. It was just all feel, man. He was, he was a genius. There's so many guys like that in the West Coast. There was Art Pepper. Did you ever meet him? Yeah, well, Art, I was going to do a, uh, an album with Art. I wanted to put him in our echo chamber. We had an acoustic chamber, well, several acoustic chambers at A&M. I want to put him in a chamber like, uh, you know, Paul Horn did that years ago uh, in uh, one of the, uh, I think it was, he was in Egypt someplace. Oh, oh, he was at the Taj Mahal. At the Taj Mahal, okay. And I wanted to do that with Art, and I thought that'd be an interesting thing because Art was, he was one of the guys that really touched me. I, I loved the way he played. It was all right from the heart. And uh, you unfortunately. You did one of his songs on your last album? Yeah, I did a song called uh, Our, song. Our Song that Art wrote. Uh, but unfortunately, he, had, he passed away. Yes. Before I had a chance to do that. <sighs> one of my favorite records is Art Pepper Plus 11. Art was something special. I, I liked Art when he was playing with the Shorty Rogers and the Giants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and did you hear him in the 50s? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I used to go to the place called the... Uh, Lighthouse? Well, I went to the Lighthouse. I saw Big J McNeely at the Lighthouse. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Big J McNeely wow. was something. He was the honker. Was he on his back when he was playing? Man, he wasn't on his back, but he, I remember he was wearing an overcoat, a hat, and he's, he was walking through the place and people were following him and you could see sweat coming through his overcoat. <laughs> And he was, oh. you know, he was one of those dun 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 yeah. dun. That was, uh, that was his thing. And the crowd went crazy. Crowd went crazy. Uh, who was the other guy you mentioned? Uh, Art Pepper. Was... Oh, well, Shorty Rogers. Oh, Shorty Rogers, uh, yeah. I can't remember the place on Hollywood Boulevard, but I used to see Shorty all the time. I liked that, that sound. I liked um, watching him with uh, Shelly Mann was playing drums with him. And, and Shorty had a real unique uh, way of expressing himself as a musician. It was different. He had his, his own little vocabulary, and it was uh, always upbeat. He was on the he was on the positive side of it all. Wow! Uh, I always remember uh, a movie, Otto Preminger movie, The Man with the Golden Arm. Yeah. Mm. And there's a scene when Frank Sinatra goes into the studio to to do his audition, and Shorty Rogers is the conductor and Shelly Mann is the drummer, and there's Jimmy Jufri playing Barry Sax. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm thinking, this is, the fifth, this is what it was like. And I, was, that, was that pretty close? Oh, yeah. Shorty did the, uh, what was that uh, movie that we really liked? The, uh, that, uh, I guess it was Man with the Golden Eye. It must Arm. have been Man with the Golden Yeah, Man. that Shorty did a lot of those orchestrations. Mm. Uh, Shorty was special, you know. He was uh, always coming by A and M, and I always had him come into the uh, control room when I was recording, and I called him the Jazz Police. <laughs> I said, if I'm doing something that's really corny or something, let me know. You put up the red flag. So I, I said, Shorty, look at, 
I'm going to give you the opportunity. You write whatever you want, and let's let's talk about you know recording it. You know, get get that thing out that you always wanted to do. And uh, it's almost like giving an architect say, "Design me a house, and when you're finished, let me know." You know, it'll <laughs> never be finished. So Shorty never finished it. She, he had a few things scribbled down that he'd like to do, but he was um, of all the you know great musicians I've met in my 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 life. He, Shorty was right on top in terms of a he was a, just a beautiful human being. Yeah, he was such a sweet person. Wow, did you ever work with Marty Page? Yes, I did. I did a thing with uh, uh, Pete Jolly. Mm -hmm. I, I produced a record with Pete Jolly, and, and Marty did some of the, the string arrangements on top, and it was, uh, he's, he's, he was a real talented guy, too. Mm. Wow. This is what I love. It's like to find people who live that. Were there. And were there and can give firsthand experiences. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is um, uh, a while back I interviewed uh, the guitarist John Abercrombie here, and he said he came to New York in the early 60s. And uh, when he came here, there were maybe five guitar players who could who could play the new uh, jazz rock music mm -hmm. and, and play with a wah wah pedal and read music. So he got him and these five guys got all the work. Today, there's five thousand guitar players who could do ten times that oh, with, yeah. with with less of the work. But back in the fifties and sixties, and it's like this is why I go back to. Uh, uh, Talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. Mm -hmm. I think when you were growing up in Southern California, there was opportunity. It was a different type of opportunity. But you know, speaking of guitar players, I, I did this uh, show, and uh, Wes Montgomery was on. Wes also recorded for CTI, and we distributed CTI. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, wow, what is that magical sound that he gets? I mean, what is that thing that, you know? He comes in with this old, funky amplifier, man. The amplifier was about this big with cobwebs all over the back of it. I mean, it was this, <laughs> and he just plug it in and bang, there, there was that sound. Wow. And here was another guy who didn't read music. Didn't read music. Did, and, you know, it was all, uh, what a feel. I mean, man, oh, man, he was a groove machine. Well, I had heard, I don't know if it was CTI, but uh, maybe it was Verve, the stuff he had done with uh, Jimmy Smith in the full mm -hmm. orchestra. And it's like uh, he was freaked out when he saw everything and he had to play along to it. And I had heard that they had dismissed the orchestra and he played his parts and then they reassembled the orchestra around right. it. Right, but he could just hear something once and he had it. You know, he, he, he just scoped it out. And Chet Baker was the same way. Chet, right. Mulligan used to tell me stories about Baker. He says he, he couldn't believe how quickly he would learn a new song and he'd just play it for him once and he'd have it. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, because they didn't read music and they, they used maybe a different part of their brain. I don't know, it's, it's magic. You know, Getz was also, uh, he, he knew the chords, he knew the changes, he knew all that stuff, but he had this, uh, what do you call it when you can retain the memory as retention? Total uh, recall? Total recall. He could read a mu music once, have it, he could turn it upside down and play it. You know what I mean? One of those guys. Well, I talked to Gary Burton about this too when he was hired by Getz, and he said he would always start a tune just by playing basic triads, and then it would come from there. But if you check out, uh, there was a Sauter, uh, Bill Finnegan record called Focus. Oh man, are you kidding? <sighs> oh my. There's no music for Getz. Well, let right? me tell you, because Stan told me about that, because it's one of my favorite it's records. It's one of mine too. Eddie Sauter laid out that uh, chart, the whole chart. Stan was playing it, just reading it as they were recording it and improvising as, as he was reading this thing. It, it, it's incredible. I mean, the guy was, he was, Stan was on another planet with his concept. I mean, he was so lyrical, he, he was funky, and he, uh, you know, he claims uh, he wouldn't play a note until it was, it's time to play it, you know. He was sexy. Yeah. He, right. The, way, the sound that he got out of the horn, it was just so specific and so distinctive. I mean, you, you knew the minute, you know, you heard that, sound it was Stan Getz. He didn't sound like anybody else. Well see that's the interesting thing when I tell my students. I said, Stan Getz
played sexy. All these guys, Zoot Sims, uh, Chet Baker. This is how you get girls, you know. It's like this is why they became musicians, maybe part of that. But it's like, oh, now we have to play fast and in odd rhythm. Yeah. But you, that's your story from uh, the army. With with the the guys were playing faster, higher. You were you were the 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 big the big guy on campus here. But when you went into the that's army, that's true. Yeah, I, I was when I was drafted. Uh, they sent me to band school. And at the time, you know, I was the first trumpet player in my school, and you know, I had a little group, and always did r rather well. They sent me to band school, and there were like twelve trumpet players from all over the country, and they they were all better than me, man. They played higher, faster, better jazz, the whole shot, you know. And I was thinking, man, if I have, I'm, I'm, if I'm ever going to be a professional, I got to really uh, come up with my own voice, my own way mm -hmm. of doing it, because I think that's what the key is to find your own voice, whether you're a painter, sculptor, dancer, you gotta find the way you do it. Because if you compare yourself to, you know, uh, Miles, or, or, or if you're a trumpet player and you, you hear Clifford Brown, you say, whoa, <laughs> stop. <laughs> you put your horn in the case, you know? But if right. you say, hey, I wanna get up to my own water level and see uh, how that works. Wow. Well, I, I think you've done it, but I think Growing up in Southern California, you, you created kind of a, a certain style. I mean, I, I would say you come more out of the, the Chet and the Miles, the cool Miles period, and even the way you sing. Well, I, you know, I think we all kind of respected Miles because he was, uh, he was true to what he was doing. You know, it wasn't about fancy notes or if he made a mistake, he was okay with it. He was about being honest to uh, the music he wanted to make. And he always picked on the right, you know, musicians to surround himself with. And, you know, there's those great stories of Coltrane. You know, you hear Coltrane at Coltrane's best, you know, when Coltrane was really ripping, you'd say, well, that's, that's pretty amazing. But when he played with Miles, he played differently. He was a little more lyrical. He was a little more patient. And sometimes, you know, he would, uh, when they'd play live, I saw him live, you know, a few times, and Coltrane would play chorus after chorus after chorus, you know, and Miles would say, hey, man, why don't you just cool it with, uh, with all these choruses you want to play? And um, Coltrane says, I don't know how to stop. And Miles says, well, why don't you take the freaking horn out of your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> did that work? I don't, I don't I think it did. I mean, you hear him on, uh, you know, uh, kind of blue, and mm -hmm. mm. he's man, real lyrical. And so I mean, that, he, wow. he was he was a yeah, that wonderful was a musician. special. special yeah, recording. he was special. You know, I had Jimmy Cobb here, and we talked about mm. the, that recording, and he said, "Oh, we just walked in. There was no music. We just Miles just figured out a few sketches." Oh, wait, Miles didn't figure. It but was, it was Bill. It was Bill Evans, man. Oh. Bill Evans had had those chords, the voicings, the whole thing. I mean, you listen to to. Uh, uh, Symphony Orchestra with Klaus Ungerman? Yes. You no, know, that, that one song that he does, like that sounds like Peace, Peace, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, flamenco sketch. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's Bill Evans at his that's finest. It, yeah. Did you ever meet Bill? Yeah, I spent an uh, afternoon with him. Wow. What, what was that like? He was a super, he was very, seemed shy. Uh, but there's a great interview with Bill and his brother. His brother oh, is a music teacher. That. and. and and Bill was demonstrating, you know, some things at the piano. And I remember that interview that uh, Mary McPartland did with Bill. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Where they played together, and at one point, Marion, she she stopped her. You know, at the end of the th things they played together, she looked at him and said, uh, "Man, I, the way you displaced the notes, I man, I was getting vertigo." <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, or when I would, Miles said that, that Bill Evans sounds like a waterfall. Oh, yes. I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Um, especially in that uh, the stuff he's playing on that television show with his brother. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, theme from Spartacus and things like that. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's a real insight. Which is very much like Emily. Yes. I was close friends with Helen Keene. Did you know her? No. Okay, so that was Bill's manager and producer. And... Uh, yeah, she had some amazing stories. Yeah. Mm. So, 
Well, I, I want to go back and uh, and use this as an educational tool, and then I want to I want to hear about your career. I want actually I want to know how did you being from Chicago? How did you get into Brazil '66? I figured all those musicians were from Brazil. They were. All the groups that Sergio had up until Brazil '66 were all Brazilian, and um, he was playing in a uh, club in Chicago. And it was his last gig with this group because they were all breaking up and they were going back to Brazil. And Sergio wanted to try one more time to put a, a band together. Only this time he felt, maybe I should use a couple of Americans. Mm. And I was singing down the street at a coffee house. And uh, this, he, was in Los this was in Chicago, Chicago in still. late 50, late 65. Ah. And um, I was 19 years old. And I was in this coffee shop singing, and he came to see me. And uh, he came up to me afterwards and asked me if I would be the lead singer for his new group that he was putting together, Brazil 66. And uh, so I went to see him. I went to see his group. I went to see what, what was this. And uh, between my shows, I went down the street and I saw him. And my first feeling was, Oh my God, that's that music that Stan Getz brought. You know, that because that's what I remembered from the girl from Ipanema with João Gilberto and, and uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim, that mm -hmm. album. That was the first time I had ever heard those rhythms and that beautiful sound of the language of Portuguese to that kind of uh, jazz, Brazilian jazz. And uh, I was very excited about that. So I followed the music. <laughs> wow. And I, I said, you'll have to ask my father. And so he came over to our apartment, and he asked my father. And my father reluctantly said, OK, but you know, if you ever have any problems, you jump right on a plane and come right home. Well, you would have been about 17 or 18 years old? I was 19. 19, OK. Because I listened to your audio book last night. And oh, you did? Yeah, with uh, Jackie, Jacqueline. Yeah, that yeah. was, yeah, that, that story was a real story. Jazz was a big part of my growing up. I can, I can tell. Yeah, it was very comforting. Well, what records were you listening to if uh, that was a story from Jackie's collection? Well, you know, when you said about opportunity and, you know, I, if I never would have made it as a professional singer, um, I, I would have still been in my room singing. I, I would sing, you know? So, I mean, you, it, it's wonderful if you could make a living at what you love to do, but you don't have to give up what you love to do just because you can't make a living at it. So um, I never thought that I would be a singer. I never, I never thought I was good enough. I didn't have the confidence, and I, it just wasn't a possibility to me. It just, all the what is it? All the cards fell in the right place and... and yeah, but there's uh, another thing. I mean, success doesn't come to you. You've got to go out and get it. I mean, there are a lot of great right. musicians out there, closet musicians who can play, yeah. you know? But you've got to be a little bit uh, verbal and you've got to be a little... You don't have to be uh, aggressive, but you have to go get it. You have to, you know, be out there. There's a lot of musicians that just practice in their basement. Exactly. They don't get out. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was, you know, the idea about being at the right place at the right time. And, yes, and I've I was heard at the right place at the right time. You were at the right place, yeah. and, and both of you. And it's like, the, I, I, this, odd, this is going through my head today, was uh, uh, when you figured out uh, about the bullfights going down to Mexico and saying, wow, I'll, I'll borrow this and this, and I'll create the Tijuana Brass. And I was thinking, well, I grew up in Iowa. And I was thinking, well, how? All we could do was tip cows over, so there was it was different. So yeah. like, so if I grew up in California, maybe. And I was in Chicago, and I think you know being prepared. You know, I I sang in my room all the time. I would come home from high school, and I would just put on my records, and I would sing with June Christie and Anita mm. O'Day and Carmen McRae and Lambert Hendricks and Ross, and I would sing Bill Evans solos with him while he was playing. And I had no idea, really, at the time, that I was building up this library of songs that I knew that were at my fingertips. If somebody turned around and said, do you know 
you know, whatever, I, I, would, I probably did. Right. And, and so I could sing it. Wow. And uh, I was prepared. I was prepared when Sergio yeah. saw me. So were you, uh, when you were checking out Bossa Nova records, were you learning to sing in Portuguese? No. I didn't. I, I did learn that the, the, the Stan Getz uh, album. I learned, you know, uh, one note samba and uh, Girl from Ipanema, of course. But um, I, I really picked it up quickly. I had the ear for it. I had the passion for it. I really wanted to sound authentically Brazilian, mm. and so I would pick the brains of all the musicians, you know. Wow. How do you say that? How did you say it? And just write it down phonetically as much as I could, and I just had a knack for it. Well, let me get your uh, bent on this. It's like uh, when Bossa Nova came in, it was really new. And I think Bossa Nova was influenced by West Coast musicians that Pacific Jazz records were distributed in South America. But when it came up here, a lot of people had difficulty trying to find the balance. I've heard uh, Coleman Hawkins do a Bossa Nova record, mm -hmm. which was kind of gruff, hard, interesting. It was definitely him, but we got used to Getz's soft sound. Well, uh, Stan understood the groove. Yeah. You know, it, the, it's not the, uh, it's, it's a different type of pulse that happens with Brazil. It's on music. one and three. It's mm -hmm. not on two and four. Right. So if you feel it at two and four, yeah, it's you, just not going to really Yeah, yeah you, sw you swing in a different way. Right. And there's actually a video on YouTube of, of Jerry Mulligan with Joe Beam. I saw and, that. With he's playing and he, he, had, he had a hard time right. uh, trying to find uh, the feel. Yeah. Yeah, And I it was like, well, I think it was one note ensemble, wasn't uh -huh. it? So. So d did you find that transition difficult for, for your music? When, when you first, I guess you assimilated Bossa Nova pretty quickly. I did. Yes. I did. And, and it wasn't just Bossa Nova. It was the different um, parts of Brazil, the music that, was, um, that I really gravitated toward that was more uh, African influenced and um, you know, it had, it had kind of like this classical primitive cross that was so beautiful to my ear mm -hmm. and the, the melodic structure of, of these songs and plus that rhythm that was constantly going. So I really gravitated toward Edu Lobo's songs, uh, Dori Caimi, Milton mm -hmm. Nascimento, those, those young uh, composers at that time that came after Jobim, that they idolized Jobim, but they had their own direction, and they took it in their own direction. And, and I really, uh, I wrote a lot of English lyrics to a lot of those songs, because mm. I had a, a feeling for those songs. Wow. Well, it's interesting, if we look at the, the, the catalog of or the history of American popular standards, by 19, it's, they usually say it's 1900 to 1950, because all those composers like Irving Berlin and and Cole Porter had, were, were like re retired or passed away by 1950. So guys like Joe Beam came around at the right time because they were creating new standards. Well, uh, Joe Beam had a knack for writing kind of complex uh, harmony structures with kind of a simple type melody. I mm -hmm. mean, what a combination. Yeah. Did you guys meet him? Oh, Did yeah. You? Oh, yeah, Lonnie had an experience with him that was really... Uh, oh, beautiful. boy. The okay. first time I was in Brazil, uh, the band was in the, in the lobby. We were waiting for something, and Jobim came. And Sergio knew Jobim, so he was, they were talking, and Jobim walked up to me and said, Lonnie, do you mind if we go up to your room for uh, a moment? I'd like to play you this uh, lyric that I wrote in English, and I'd like to know what you think of it, because I know you write... <laughs> English lyrics, you know, I was like, what, 22 or something? It was, I couldn't even believe he was, you know, asking to come up to my room. So we went up to my room, and he sat on one bed, and I sat on the other bed, and he plays, so close your eyes. Oh, my gosh. For that's a lovely way to be. You know, and it was amazing. And, and, and at the end, he said, what do you think? Do you think it's a good lyric or not? Oh boy! Yeah, the guy was—he was a genius for sure. 
Wow. The fundamental loneliness goes yeah. when two can dream a dream together. Man, this is his second language, and he wrote. <laughs> yeah. And not only that, I mean, you know, just, I mean, the Waters of March lyric, oh, yes. you know, is such a profound lyric. I do it really slow and kind of in minor because you really get a chance to really listen to that lyric. It's, yes. it's such a profound lyric. And uh, it's usually done very fast, very cute, in a cute way. But um, I like to do it in a, in a slow. I mean, it, that he wrote that lyric in English before he wrote it in, in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one note samba, it's just, he's so amazing. So just, did you guys ever get a chance to record with him? Well, you know, I had this in mind. In fact, uh, you know, we have a place here in New York and uh, Jobim had a place in the same complex and I was gonna do, I wanted to do an album with Jobim singing in English and Lonnie singing in Portuguese. I thought that would have been a sweet wow. album, but uh, he unfortunately passed on. Yeah, but we, we, oh. played, we played together, I think it was the Equinox album mm -hmm. with Trishti and you know, yeah. those songs. We, he played on, on an album that uh, Sergio Mendes in Brazil 66 did um, and he was playing guitar and singing in the background too with everybody. So we, we got mm -hmm. a little chance to, to, to record. He was that. a spectacular guy, very unpretentious. Yeah, very Just a real guy, a, a real person. Very sweet. Well, you know, continuing in the bossa nova lineage, it's like uh, you guys were smart. Brazil 66, when they recorded Fool on the Hill, to take uh, other genres, Beatles tunes, turn them into that. Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. The look of love. Yes with a little help from my friends and um, we did uh, Scarborough Fair. Yeah, we took, we took a lot of modern at the time. And it was so, hugely successful. Yeah. Yes. How about that Sinatra record with Joe Beam? I liked it. I, I thought too. it was really sweet. I think Sinatra really kind of, uh, I don't think there was anyone better than Frank Sinatra in terms of expressing himself, expressing a lyric, mm. expressing a feeling. I think he was Absolutely, the real thing. <laughs> yeah, and he—you could—you could tell how much he, who, he in appreciation he was yes. to the music. You know, for the music, it was—you uh, could—you could hear the respect yes. that he was, that his appro in his intention. And I'm—I'm I'm not sure if Klaus Ogerman worked with you, with your label. Uh, Klaus, well, I saw him record uh, Freddie Hubbard at our. Custom studios. That, ah. was, that was interesting, but Klaus is, uh, you know, a giant. He's yeah. still around, right? Oh yeah, he's still around. Oh. I think he's retired. Yes. Uh, Tommy Lapuma kind of kind of got him out of retirement for a few moments there with uh, Diana Krall. Diana Krall. I, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, he's he's really special. That the album that he did with with uh, Bill Evans is is uh, just a pivotal yeah. album in my life. You know, yeah. If I was on a alone on a desert island, what what album would I bring? It would be that album. Yes. It, not whipped cream and other delights. No, no, but <laughs> it would be that album, and then the album that that you did, um, you know, that we were listening to before we left, because you put, put Aria, our daughter, Aria. You wrote a song oh, for fan, her. Oh, um, I would bring that album too. Oh, okay. Mm. She's off the hook. Uh, hey, listen, this is all videotape, so it's posterity. We've got to get it all in. Now, I want to, I, odd uh, question here. It's like, uh, I always talk about with artists, it's like there's a bridge between when nobody knows you and then the other side of the bridge is, oh, it's Herb Alpert and Lonnie. So, you know, how do we get, how did you guys get from one side of the bridge to the next, I, I, your your life is pretty documented with uh, your the Lonely Bowl. And well, it, it started long before the Lonely Bowl. But let, let me say yeah. this, but and and I say that there's a lot of odd p opportunities that you took af you afforded yourself. Like uh, I read, you were in the Ten Commandments. Well, I was in several movies as a background musician. Ten Commandments. Yeah, I spent about th three months in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just as uh, I played uh, timpani or uh, that big kettle drum and I o Aida horn, you know. Just, and they opened up on your back? Yeah, idolizing really? the golden calf. Uh, Moses was coming down from uh, 
grabbing the Ten Commandments, and the scene was opening up on my back, you know, and I turned around to uh, Cecil B. the Mill, who was up in the boom with the cameraman, and I said, <laughs> Do you mind uh, opening up on my face? <laughs> and, and he looked at me. Said, Not this time, kid. Uh, <laughs> but you can keep the golden calf. Yeah, right. Wow. But, so there's a lot of, I mean, I, you may not have been fully formed with a direction at that point, right? Because I know you were taking acting lessons and, and uh, trying to Well, I took out. acting lessons for a while. But, you know, I have this classical background. I studied classical music for I guess eight, eight, ten years, and, and with some great musicians. And then I was playing in these little symphony orchestras. And at one point, we were playing uh, pictures at an exhibition, and I was just knocked out by the sound of the orchestra. And I was leaning forward, and I forgot to come in, you yeah. know, at my at my part. So I, at that point, I said, mm -hmm. "You had the solo?" No, it wasn't a solo. It was wasn't the ta ta. No, it was just That's one great of those parts. Uh, I was not the only trumpet player there. There was other trumpet. They covered it, but. I said, man, I don't want to do that anymore. I'd like to just close my eyes and, you know, play whatever I want to play whenever I want to play it. And that's when I kind of got, got into listening to, uh, you know, Louis Armstrong and uh, the guys. Well, that reminds me because I saw a video of you. You had a, a summer special and you had Louis Armstrong on. Oh, man, that was beautiful. I played with Louis. And I'm telling you, of all the great musicians that I've met, he was the one who really personified his personality came right through his horn. That's, that was Louis. It was upbeat, he was friendly, he was real, he was great. And at one point, I, uh, we were just you know, talking, I was interviewing, I said, well, what do your friends call you? I know, you, you, you know, you, Satchmo is the, is the name a lot of people use. I said, what do your friends call you? He said, Irving. <laughs> 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 he, I love that guy, man, he was. Uh, were you able to stay in touch with him? I did for a while, but uh, you know, he was going around the world doing his thing. Hmm. Well, I want to talk a minute about your label, because I, I don't know how you landed so many amazing, that became amazing stars through you. The Carpenters and, and uh, Joe Cocker and, uh, and uh, Cat Steve and the police. And yeah, we had Quincy Jones, we had uh, Jackson. Jackson. You know, Mulligan and Stan. And, how many? Uh, Milton Nascimento with, and Ed Dulobo in Brazil 66, too, brought in the Brazilian crowd. Were there people that you didn't sign that you wished you had? Um, there was this one, you know, masters used to f be floating around in the 60s where someone would record a group, they'd play it for you, and if you liked it, you can, you know, bring it into the company for distribution. There was one record that I turned down because I didn't like it. Uh, I just thought it was too long, it was out of tune, and it was just not my type of thing. Anyways, I turned it down, and it became a number one record for about oh six gosh. weeks, you know. Wow. So, I, you know, I think the point is, me saying this, is that you, nobody knows what a hit record's like, you know. Yes. And a and we tried to, um, um, for the most part, we weren't looking for the beat of the week or the the flavor of the month. We were trying to get artists that had something special to say in their own unique way, you know, like Cat Stevens. Well, didn't you, I, I saw somewhere that uh, Taste of Honey was a side B track. Taste of Honey was a side B track. And when I got a group together, finally, there was no Tijuana Brass Group up through the uh, Whipped Cream and Other Delights album. And we were playing in Seattle, Washington, and every time I played Taste of Honey, the people, I mean, went, I, I, that reaction was like a focus group. So I told my partner, Jerry, that I said, we're on the wrong side, it's Taste of Honey. He kept saying, I don't think so. You know, you can't dance to this thing, it's too long, it stops in the middle twice, and it's not good for radio. What was on the other side? A third man theme. Oh. Yeah, which was a, Interesting record. It was more, you know, Kurt Vile. Yeah, it was more, um, you know, heavy, heavier groove. But uh, we finally turned, you know, Taste of Honey over, and, and it became. It, it really was the big door opener for the Tijuana Brass. Wow. And how did you get to know Bert Bacharach? Well, Bert recorded for A and M. Uh huh. Bert uh, was friends with Jerry, my partner, before. Uh, 
I even met Jerry. I guess uh, you know he's from New York, and they had known each other. Bert was uh, and is uh, a unique talent. I mean, this guy is. It, 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 this stuff comes right through him. You know, it's, it's like he, he's um, he lives every note that he plays. He called me about uh, I guess about six months ago. He wanted me to hear a song that he wrote with. Um, uh, Elvis, Elvis Costello. Costello, but they, it was rejected because they're doing a musical, and this particular song, Bert liked the melody a lot. He called me, asked me to come by his house, and then I did, and he sat down on the piano and, and was playing this thing for me like he was performing it. I mean, it was, you know, his, his heart and soul was in playing this song for me, and, you know, after he finished, I looked and I said, man, you are something really magically special, you know? Gave him a big hug, and I said, thank you, man. This is, and the song is beautiful. I recorded it, and it'll be on my next uh, wow. album. Wow, wow. So he keeps yeah, he, going. It's really touching. Bert is, uh, really touching. He's, he's special. So I was watching a video of you singing, This Guy's in Love With You. And uh, it was like this typical 1960s uh, TV show where you're, you're bending oh, down, oh. there's a group of women there. On the, on the soundstage. Oh, 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 yeah. It's kind of like this sexy thing. How did, how, did you feel comfortable doing that? No, not in that particular period in my life. I was having a real struggle playing the trumpet. I was going through a divorce, mm -hmm. and uh, I just, I, I, the music was not um, easy for me to produce at that point, and that I was, you know, we had a commitment to do that show. And so that was a little bit of a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, but he played, you know, he played, he did it, uh, a couple of albums with Hugh Masekela, yes. and we went on the road, and uh, with Jeff Lorber, and the great Wings album with Michelle Colombier, right. you yeah. know, that classical jazz. Yeah, I did, well, I did a record, with, uh, a single with Stan Getz yeah. called Friends, yes. which is kind of beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Well, you've certainly, you know what they say, surround yourself with people that are greater than you. And, yeah. Right. Well, better than that, surround yourself with people that make you feel good. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Even better. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, in our remaining time, I'm just, you know, you guys have done so much. You've had such amazing lives. Uh, how, do, how do we transmit that and uh, convey that to young musicians and young artists? Well, because everything's I, changed so much. The, re the, the records industry, I, I, there's oh, not it's much a whole room. It's a different world now. You know, and I think, um, I always tell young artists that, I mean, he, yet, if you're not passionate about what you're doing, about playing your instrument or dancing or doing whatever, don't do it. There's so many people out there that want the same thing you want, and while you're sleeping, they're practicing, you know? Right. So you gotta stay on top of your game. Be sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Certainly don't do it for money. There's no... Uh, commercial value seriously in in the arts i mean it, it's 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 to enliven the, the senses you know and if you're lucky enough to be able to record or do the thing you love to do and you can make a living at it great mm -hmm. but uh, be sure you're doing it for the right reasons and don't forget that uh kindness is contagious you got to be kind yes do you guys see any cracks in the pavement with light shining through it for new opportunities that might? Well, for, uh, for us, you know, we've been uh, on the road now for the past eight years. We've been doing this show that we do and, and uh, always changing it, morphing it. It's very improvisational. And in the beginning, there were older people that were there, fans of, of uh, um, the Tijuana Brass and Brazil 66. And now, though, there's a lot of younger people in, in, in the audience. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, you know, when the word spreads and using the Internet doesn't, doesn't hurt, um, you just have to be uh, thinking more out of the box now. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah, because for the most part, radio is pretty stingy in what they're willing to play. You know, they got to categorize into certain types of right. music. And uh, I think... Probably another time and another conversation, but I, I think jazz needs to go someplace. I think the days of playing the song, taking a couple courses, playing the, the song again, I don't think that's going to get it. I think, I think Miles, Miles understood that, and I think, I think he brought it forward because he was never looking back, and he was always 
he was always saying, why are these guys you know, still trying to play bebop? Man, when bebop was happening with Miles and Charlie Parker, nobody came to see him. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, th I think that's uh, an interesting correlation with uh, uh, back in the heyday of recordings in the 60s and maybe early 70s when, you, when string orchestras and large groups were at, uh, at the record companies beckoning call. Uh, things change now in, in the jazz world with, uh, okay, let's go in a day, we'll, we'll lay down some tunes with a quartet and burn CDs and that's it. So I think it's an economic reason, you know, it's like, why not create full orchestra and ensemble and feature like they did with uh, Klaus Hogerman with Dinah Krall. Mm -hmm. I know it's expensive, but uh, why can't that happen for you know, we have high-definition television. Why don't we have high-definition music on television? Amen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> all right, let's go. <laughs> so, listen, uh, thank you. I know we're just about out of time here. Okay. But, but is there any, any words of wisdom, anything that you can <laughs> convey to everybody who's going to watch this? And I know a lot of people are going to watch this. And um, I would just say stay true to yourself. Absolutely. Don't try to sound like somebody else. Don't, or just, yeah, if you're a singer, don't try to sound like another singer. No, I they, think that's the key to being an artist these days. It's uh, find your own voice, work at it, accept it, try to get up to your own water level, you know, mm -hmm. with uh, help, you know, you can, all sorts of great teachers out there. But be true to yourself and don't compromise. Don't do it for the, the wrong reasons. It's not to be popular or to make a lot of money. Right. And uh, one more thing. We want to talk about your career as a, as a writer now. <laughs> I, I have a book out, Emotional Memoirs and Short Stories. Uh, one of them is actually called The Professor, and it is the uh, story of the trumpet teacher that taught her when he was having problems with the horn um, but I made him a, a singing teacher in the book mm -hmm. and I got a chance to to uh, write about how I feel about singing and uh, the story that you mentioned before come rain or come shine mm -hmm. that was uh, a story a, a story with a backdrop of jazz and um, it's a, a collection of ten short stories with a running narrative connecting all of them and uh, it it's, was very, very gratifying, and, and I've always written, but I, I never really thought I would publish something, and, and then I, I had the opportunity to, and I did. And on the audio version, you've included your husband. Yes, and in yeah. the audio version, I, I put a soundtrack right. on, onto all these ten short stories, kind of like movie music. And in the first one, uh, Herb, uh, I found something that he did with Michel Colombier and Ed Eduardo Del Barrio, and, uh, and I used that music for a couple of the stories. Well, I was listening to that, and I'm saying, Lonnie's a beatnik. <laughs> I'm a beatnik, <laughs> yeah. Beatnik, yeah. <laughs> so it's especially the first part of it was so flowery, and it came yeah. out. It's like but that was intentional. Jack Kerouac, yeah. Mm. That was intentional yeah. to yeah. be flowery. But then when things started turning in that story, it suddenly changed the color. Yes. Yeah. Tone well, changed. Well, hopefully we'll get you back and we can talk about your art career. Okay. That, that my wife would like to hear about. Oh, yeah. She's a painter. And uh, thank you both. It's really an thank honor to meet you, you guys. Sure. And uh, We had fun. Yeah. That's the bottom line, right? <laughs> well... That's the stuff I want to do now. Yes. Now that I'm uh, approaching the big 80. Wow. <laughs> you don't look a day over 79. So. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> well, 79 is the new 80. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.